Great. Okay. Um, thanks everybody for being here. I'm Dr. Amanda Dye, and we are here this evening to talk about the primary application process. Um, this event is specifically for folks who are planning to apply to health professions programs this summer, specifically those who are participating in Barnard's committee process um, and need to learn how to do lots of things relating to that process. So uh, let's get started. My goals today are for us to review some of the key aspects of the summer application process, just to make sure that everybody has a good sense of what to expect as we go into the months um, beginning with May. Uh, we will talk about the steps that you'll need to take to request your committee letter, um, and we will talk a little bit about the timeline for and components of primary applications as well as some other parts of the application process that are uh, important. And along the way, I'm gonna highlight some resources that will be super helpful to you, depending on what kind of application you are submitting this summer. So it's a long agenda, let's get right to it. First part is about how you're gonna request your committee letter. So anybody who is um, part of our committee process this year, um, many of you probably have already done your interviews. Some folks will have interviews taking place this week or next week. And uh, at the end of April, we wrap that up. The next step after you complete your committee interview is eventually to request your committee letter. Um, and so that's where part three of the committee application comes in. You're gonna initiate this request through the same portal that you've used to submit your committee application and the same portal that you are currently using to track your letters of recommendation. We will allow you to provide um, some optional updates as part of this request process, and we'll ask for some required information about your application, including when you submitted it and any application IDs. The most important thing for you to know, and that I will have to say again and again, um, but that I will uh, gladly say again and again, is that you must submit a primary application before you can request your committee letter. That means if you're applying to MD programs, you need to submit the AMCAS application. Um, if you're applying to dental programs, you're gonna submit the IDEA ADSAS application and then request your committee letter. The screen that you'll use is going to look something like this. If you're logging in now, you're going to see something of this nature with probably a mix of some letters that have been received and some that you're still awaiting. Um, two key things to keep in mind here. Uh, if you see on your side that the schedule interview um, item is marked as awaiting, ignore that. That's a technical error. You don't need to do anything. Um, at the bottom, the most important thing is that you remember to check that all of your individual letters have been received before you request your committee application. So part three of the committee application will enable you to provide some optional updates. This, um, this section you don't have to complete, but you can. Um, if you are currently enrolled in coursework, and you have an updated GPA or updated transcripts since the time you submitted your committee application, you can include those in, um, in your part three submission. You can also upload a, res a new resume or CV if you have one. You can upload your final personal statement. You can add updates in the provided boxes. These are the screens for what that will look like. All of that, however, is optional. And I'll explain why that is uh, in just a second. So the um the kind of process here is first you need to submit your primary application and confirm that your letters of recommendation have all been received by our office they're going to be marked off in um in your committee application portal then once you have figured out you know that everything is ready you can submit this form um, and you'll be able to select which application service you're using you'll be able to add your application idea application ID. Um, if you're applying to AMCAS, you will also have a letter ID, and that number will be important to include. And you'll include the date that you submitted your primary application. You can uh, add more than one. So if you're applying to both AMCAS and ACOMAS, for example, you can uh, add requests for both of these. Then the final step and the most uh, potentially important step is to save a copy of your submitted primary application and email it to us at prehealthdocs at barnard.edu. 
This is the step that triggers us to finalize your committee application. It provides us with all of the final versions of your activity descriptions, as well as your personal statement. And that's why those other updates are optional, because we're always going to have this copy of the submitted primary application. And, um, and that's going to include all of the key information there. If you are applying to AMCAST, uh, you're going to see that there's a button that says print application on the right side of your screen when you're kind of just looking at the application. Um, you can hit that and print it to a PDF. You should make sure that the printout includes your submission date and time. We will send the request back to you and ask you to, to resend us that copy if it doesn't have the submission date or time. If you're applying to ADSAS or ACOMAS, um, they use a different system. They actually use the same software, so the applications look quite similar. That system will allow you to generate one PDF per school that you've applied to. You can choose any representative school. The uh, experiences, descriptions, and your personal statement are going to be the same for all programs. So um, any one of the schools you've applied to will do for this purpose. Um, the main reason that we collect primary application files is, number one, to help me with advising, um, but also to help me have the most current information about your application before um, I finalize your committee letter. Once you have submitted uh, part three of the committee application and sent us a copy of your submitted primary application, you can expect that your committee letter will be uploaded to your application service in four to six weeks. That usually aligns really well with the time that it takes the application service itself to verify your application and share it with professional programs. After you submit part three, you're not going to be able to submit up, uh, additional updates via the committee application portal, but you can always email prehealthdocs at barnard.edu um, with any additional updates, questions, et cetera, like things like that. If you submit the request for your committee letter and then later your application plans change, that is maybe you submit your ACOMAS application and then later decide, actually, I'm not going to apply this year, you need to notify us as soon as possible. These are some important dates to keep in mind. So you're going to have access to be able to submit part three starting in May. And that aligns with the dates that most of these applications are, that all of these application services open. Um, crucially, the last day to request your committee letter is going to be August 1st. It is August 1st every year. That means that if you are requesting a committee letter, you need to plan to submit your primary application before August 1st so that you can request your letter uh, by August 1st. And our goal is always to have all letters uploaded, everything done by September 1st so that um, things are moving along with the application cycle. Okay, uh, next thing is about letters of recommendation. So now is the time when you should be monitoring to make sure that your letters of recommendation are being received. You can log into the committee application portal and navigate to the letter writer section. We are um, uh, marking letters received during business hours. So if we get a letter on a weekend, typically it's going to be marked as received on that Monday. Um, if we get a letter overnight, usually it's the next business day. Um, you can still add letter writers at this point, and they will receive the message with application, uh, sorry, with letter submission instructions. Please know if you are setting, if you are adding people to that letter writer list in your committee application right now, they're going to get a message that says the deadline for letters of recommendation is May 15th which is very quickly approaching. Um, if you are requesting a letter at this point, it is your responsibility to communicate with the letter writer regarding their timeline for submitting that letter. I really do not want to get angry emails from letter writers saying you're not giving me enough time to submit this letter. Um, it's very important for you as the applicant to be in touch with each of your writers. The due date that is listed in the uh, in the automatic email that letter writers get is May 15th. However, if a letter is not received by May 15th, you do not need to panic. We intentionally do set that deadline a little bit early so that we can give a little bit of leeway um, without changing anything about your application timeline. It's good to make sure that you are in contact with any letter writer who hasn't submitted a letter by May 15th to kind of get a sense of what their timeline looks like. 
and ensure that the writer can submit the letter by the time you plan to submit your, your primary application. So if your goal, for example, is to submit your primary application on June 10th, then the letter needs to be to us before June 10th. Essentially, you know, you're kind of working on your own timeline at this point, and you can, you know, negotiate whatever timeline looks correct for you um, with, a, with an individual letter writer. If a letter writer has uh, realized that they need a lot more time, you can talk to me about other options, including taking their letter out of the committee letter and having them submit it directly to the application service later. Um, but that's usually only the case if someone needs a great deal more time um, to, uh, to be able to produce the letter. Okay, um, important information about primary applications. Here are some key dates to keep in mind. Uh, if you are applying to MD programs through AMCAS, the American Medical College Application Service, you're gonna be able to actually log into that application and start entering data on May 1st. The first day that you are going to be able to hit submit on that application is May 28th, at, after which point AMCAS is going to start to verify applications once they have all of the required documents. And the first day that they are going to share verified applications with schools is on June 28th. This is a step that AMCAS always takes to ensure that people are not going too far in the pursuit of submitting really, really early. Um, you know, it's folks who have submitted within the first couple of weeks of the application being open are typically verified around the end of June and are typically, those applications are typically all shared with schools at the same time. ACOMAS for DO programs works a little bit differently. There's only one date, May 6th. That's the first day that you can open the ACOMAS application and you can hit submit as soon as you're done. Um, if you are applying to dental programs through ADEA ADSAS, May 14th is gonna be your first day to open up the application and start entering your data. And June 4th is gonna be the first day that you can hit submit on that application. And we're gonna talk in the rest of this section about what's in uh, what's these applications. In, what's in, what's in. Um, Let's see. Uh, so this is kind of the workflow so that you're all understanding the way these application services work. Um, first, you're going to complete and submit an online application form. And you're going to pay the fees that are required for the application service or services that you're using. Then you are going to make sure that your official transcripts are all sent to the application service and the people who work for the application service are going to verify your coursework and calculate GPAs by comparing the information on your official transcripts with the information that you've listed in the application. Once the application service has finished its verification process, it is going to then share your application with all of the schools that you've designated as places that should receive your application. And then we will also upload your committee letter directly to your application service, which again is gonna transmit the information to all of the schools that you've designated should receive it. The Basically the, the, the centralized application services are kind of a clearinghouse. You know, they're putting all of the data in one place and they're sharing it out with everyone that you say should receive the information. So <clears throat> if you are applying to MD programs through AMCAS, you're gonna submit a, an application that includes eight sections. The first three are background information, information about um, you, your family, a little bit about where you grew up, contact info, all of that sort of stuff. The fourth section is um, a section where you're going to list all of your coursework. You're going to um, classify your courses according to their content, etc. Section five is the work and activities. So there you'll be able to list up to 15 experiences uh, and write about them as we've discussed in previous program. Um, in section six, you're going to be able to document any letters of evaluation that you're receiving. If all of your individual letters are coming to Barnard for us to send with your committee letter, then you only need to make one entry in this section. You just need to list your committee letter. You do not need to document your individual letters separately. The seventh section is where you select the schools that you want to apply to and what program types at those schools. So that would be where 
you, for example, indicate that you're applying to MD, PhD programs or MD programs or com another kind of combined degree program. The eighth section is where you're going to upload your personal statement. And if you are applying MD, PhD, there are two additional essays that you'll need to complete there. Um, and the ninth section is where you'll document standardized tests. Um, all medical schools require the MCAT and your MCAT information will automatically populate into your, um, your AMCAS application uh, because the AAMC owns both of these. Your, uh, your application and your MCAT score are linked to the same ID number. However, you are able to note a planned or future test if that's applicable to you. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. This year, it costs $170, $175 to submit one application to a medical school. So your, uh, your primary application comes with one school and you'll pay $46 per additional school that you had. So ultimately the, the cost of the application is gonna depend on the number of programs you're choosing. For a COMIS, you'll see that the sections are arranged a little bit differently, but essentially the information that you're being asked to provide is basically the same for this application service. So personal information, information about academic history here, including the standardized exams, um, supporting information includes letters of evaluation, the personal statement, and your experiences. Uh, program materials are a difference between AMCAS and ACOMIS. Sometimes um, ACOMIS schools will have specific questions that you need to answer that pertain just to that school sent through the application service itself. Um, ACOMIS is a little bit more expensive. It's $199 to submit to one school plus uh, $55 for each additional school. And then ADIA ADSAS is the application service for dental schools. Again, you'll see the information you're gonna be asked for is basically the same. Um, some dental schools will have supplemental questions as part of the ADEA ADSAS application. Many do not use separate secondary applications and there's a link uh, there where you can learn a little bit more. ADEA ADSAS is the most expensive of the application services we're talking about today, um, 264 for one school and 115 per additional school. Although keep in mind, because you're not gonna be submitting secondary applications, uh, you are not gonna be submitting secondary application fees as a dental school applicant. When you are documenting your committee letter in your application service, whichever one you're going to use, you're going to need to use this information. You do not have to take a screenshot of this screen. I'm going to send this information to you in an email, but it's here for you all to refer to. It's very important that you include prehealthdocs at barnard.edu as the author email because all of our accounts are linked to that email. Transcripts are going to be your responsibility. So Beyond Barnard does not request transcripts for you. You will request your transcripts from Barnard and any other institution of higher education that you've attended. So if you have any coursework that you did over a summer, if you have a graduate degree, all of those circumstances are ones in which you would be requesting transcripts to be sent to your application service. It's a good idea to request an official transcript for yourself so that you can see exactly what schools are going to see when they're reviewing your application and you can input all of your course information correctly. If you have already completed your undergraduate and any graduate courses, you know, if you're not currently in classes, then essentially you can request your transcript as soon as you start your application. If you are currently in classes, I would strongly recommend waiting to request your official transcript until all of your spring 2024 grades are posted. There's a link here for the registrar's website. Um, AMCAS uses a transcript request form and you can email that to transcripts at barnard.edu once you have uh, submitted the transcript request form. Primary applications are going to ask you to classify your coursework. So you've all heard me talk about the science GPA, and this is how we get the science GPA, by uh, classifying your coursework as part of that GPA. Every application service has its own policies regarding how course classification works. So you should pay attention to what is required for your application service, and you should use the guides that your application service provides. Typically, um, as, as particularly for AMCAS, you're going to be classifying your courses according to their primary content versus the department of origin. So for example, 
a stats course taken in the psych department is classified as math because the content is statistics rather than psychology because it's offered in a psychology department. Um, if you think that a course is marginal, you know, I would say go based on what the majority of the content is for the course. And if you think that there is a chance that uh, a third party viewer might not exactly understand where you're coming from with course classification, it's a great idea to keep a copy of your syllabus for the course on hand, um, just in case the application service changes your classifications and you want to contest that change, which you can do as an applicant. Um, this screenshot here is just the list of different topics of coursework that fall under the BCPM or Science GPA for AMCAS. But again, you'll want to refer to the lists that go with the application service that you're using. Uh, if you're applying to both AMCAS and ACOMAS, you'll, you're probably going to have to uh, classify some of your coursework a little bit differently because the two application systems don't work exactly the same way. When you are submitting your application, you're also going to be asked to list all of your activities, experiences, et cetera, et cetera. We did a whole presentation on this, but just as a quick reminder, if you are having trouble deciding what category an experience fits under, choose the best fit that you can and use the space that you have in, in the description box to clarify as you need. Um, when it comes to contact info, here again, do your best. And remember that you can use yourself as the contact person if there's not um, another person who can verify your participation. Um, you can use multiple date ranges in some application service uh, services. Some application services will allow you to include projected hours of uh, experience for the future. Some will only allow you to include um, completed hours of experience. So again, Instruction manuals are your best friend. When you're thinking about uh, application essays, make sure that they're ready in advance of your planned submission date. You don't wanna be kind of last minute fumbling around with those. Remember, as I uh, wrote to everyone last week, conferences with the writing fellows are open. So that's a resource that you can use. And once you paste your application into, or once you paste the personal statement into your application, I cannot stress enough Formatting gets weird sometimes, so print your application before you submit it, and literally it could be print to PDF, it doesn't have to be a physical copy, but what you want to do is to see what is going to be rendered on the reader side, so that if there are any formatting things, you can correct them before you submit, because you're not going to be able to do so after. Uh, test scores. Application services will always allow you to submit an application without a test score. So it, let's say you have an MCAT planned for, I don't know, June 1st, and you want to submit your AMCAS application on May 30th, you can do that. Um, you only need to select one school in order to have your application submitted and verified. So if you are waiting on a test score to decide about which schools you want to add, you can do that after you have a test score. So even if your application has already been processed, um, it doesn't have to be reprocessed if you add additional schools to it later. Um, you can submit an application, you know, early and, uh, and add more schools if necessary. If you are submitting your application before a test date or before uh, scores are released for a test date, please make sure that you document your planned test dates in your application. This is really important so that professional schools know that you're expecting additional scores. Either for a first-time test taker or for a retester, it's very important to signal to the schools, hey, there's going to be another test score in some, some matter of weeks or months. Um, a couple of other important things to keep in mind. Uh, as you saw in the committee application, um, we talked about institutional actions. All primary application services require applicants to disclose whether they have received any institutional action from a college or medical school. If you're not sure about whether you have any institutional actions on your records, um, you should reach out to Madeline Camacho for conduct related things, including things uh, in residence halls. And if you have questions about whether you've received academic institutional action, um, contact Dean Holly Tedder. 
if you become the subject of an institutional action after you've submitted a primary application, the rule is that you have to notify the schools individually um, to let them know. And uh, typically you have to notify them within 10 days of the receipt of the action. Hopefully this doesn't apply to anyone, uh, but just in case it's uh, good to keep in mind. There are similar restrictions for legal action. Again, the most important thing to know is that uh, if you have been convicted of or pleaded guilty or no contest to a felony or misdemeanor, uh, in most cases, you're going to need to disclose. There are a couple of individual states that have different kinds of laws. So this is something to check into. But do know that a lot of medical schools conduct background checks. So it's better to disclose something than not, if especially if it could come up on a background check. Um, residency for applications. So your primary application service is only going to allow you to designate one state as your state of legal residence. If you are applying to any public schools, you should check school websites for information about what their criteria are for establishing and demonstrating state residency. You should also know that if you're accepted to a public medical school or dental school, you may be required to submit additional documentation after uh, you've been accepted to verify that you're eligible for in-state tuition. Um, there's an example here from SUNY Upstate about how you can show that you are a New York State resident. Uh, application services are also going to allow you to indicate both permanent and preferred contact information. Uh, I would say preferred contact information is where you want to indicate how to best reach you during the application period. You should make sure that the email address that you list is one that you're going to have continual access to. Your permanent and preferred contact information could be the same. That's also OK. Um, you should make sure that you're monitoring spam filters just in case messages from application services or schools are filtered out. And um, application services will ask you for physical mailing addresses. A lot of people will put like their family home address uh, as a permanent address there. Either way, it doesn't really matter. Uh, in, in the modern day, almost no schools actually send physical information, um, at least not until the very, very end of the process. Before you submit your primary application, you are going to be asked to confirm that the application uh, information that you've submitted is accurate and comprehensive. You should make sure that everything has been proofread very, very carefully for grammatical and spelling errors. Because again, you're not gonna be able to edit the vast majority of this stuff once you've hit submit. Um, applications will also ask you whether you uh, consent to release your application information to your advisor. I ask that you do please select yes. Um, and if you are have any questions about it, you can definitely ask me. I am the only person who directly accesses this information, but it's very helpful for me in advising you through the course of the cycle. And um, I can collect a de-identified data um, in the aggregate to kind of understand admission statistics to help future applicants as well. Once you have submitted your application, as I said, most of the data cannot be changed. There's a list here of things that AMCAS allows you to update. Um, these are things that include like name and contact info. Um, information about your letters of evaluation can be, um, can be changed. Uh, well, it can be updated. You can't delete old entries, but you can add new ones. You can add a new MCAT date if that happens. You can add medical schools. You can change the program type that you're applying, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and most application services are going to be something like this, where you're not going to be able to change anything about your personal statement. You're probably not likely to be able to change anything about any experiences that you've already listed in your application. So the content of your application really is going to stay the same once you've hit submit. It is crucial to use application service manuals and help sections for guidance. Every one of these application service ha services has a really robust um, set of resources online. And I've linked you here to the 2025 AMCAS Applicant Guide, which is for the first time not a PDF. It is a searchable website now. It's really, really easy to use. There are also email addresses and applicant-specific hotlines that you can call if you have questions. 
Okay, um, I'm going to hop into just some brief things about secondary applications and other aspects of the application process. Most of you already know secondary applications are school specific supplemental applications. These are very, very common for MD programs and some DO programs use them as well. Very few dental schools do. Uh, most often schools are sending secondaries to all applicants after they receive the primary application. However, it is possible for a school to send you a secondary before your application has been verified. Some of them will get basic contact information from the application service and they'll just say, hey, we have your email address. We know you're applying. We haven't seen your application, but here's a secondary if you want to submit it. Um, very few schools do pre-screening of applications, so you should plan to be submitting secondaries for almost, if not all, of the schools that you are applying to. Usually you're going to be asked to supply between about like three and five uh, responses to short um, essay questions. And usually you're going to have to pay a fee of somewhere around $100, although there's a little bit of variation uh, between schools. Secondary applications are important because they are your best opportunity to express your interest in and fit to a particular program, whereas the primary application is going to be the same for every school. And it's a good idea to aim to complete your secondaries within a couple of weeks of receiving the links. It's also super important to keep records of your secondary application responses because you may not be able to view them post submission. So if you want to Kind of use an answer as a model to create other answers from, you need to make sure that you have a local copy of that. Um, you, and again, you may find that schools are asking relatively similar questions in some, uh, um, some instances. So just making sure that uh, you're, you know, modifying things appropriately. If you do this, make sure to proofread for school names. There's nothing worse than a school getting a secondary answer that lists another school's name. You can find uh, previous year's questions on a lot of internet forums, although do note schools can change their questions from year to year. Um, the current application year questions usually show up on the forums basically seconds after somebody gets the first secondary. Um, another part of the secondary process that we, is not always obligatory, but is relatively common, are assessments. So some health professional schools use what we call situational judgment tests or assessments as part of their application review process. These are assessments that are very different from the MCAT or the DAT. Um, you're not being tested on a fund of knowledge specifically, but in a situational judgment test, you're being given a scenario and you're going to be asked how you might respond to that scenario. The questions that schools are trying to answer with, um, you know, these kinds of assessments is how are, how well do you uh, reason and communicate and how consistent is your response with the ethics of the profession? Usually assessments are um, used as part of the secondary screening process. So a school would be reviewing your application once you have um, once they have your primary, your secondary, your assessments, and your letters of recommendation, et cetera, all of that together is required before they're going to review your application for an interview. So since most application services do require at least a few weeks of processing time, I often encourage people to schedule these assessments during that you know, month or so when your primary application is being processed so that you'll have a score around the time your secondaries are completed. Schools can use these scores differently in their application screening processes. There's not a general consensus on exactly how this works. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about two commonly used tools. Um, so CASPER is the older of the two, and the AAMC preview exam, um, which was formerly known as the AAMC situational judgment test, um, are the two most common uh, in use for medical schools. Um, dental schools sometimes use the CASPER, but not all. Uh, if you do need accommodations for these kinds of assessments, so there, uh, there's reading, there's writing involved, things like that, it is really crucial to apply early. Um, if you have been approved for MCAT accommodations and you are testing with AAMC preview, do know that you have to reapply for accommodations for preview, although usually the review process is expedited. Okay, so um, CASPER is required by some of a lot of different kinds of health professions programs. It's offered by a company called Acuity Insights, so it's not related to um, the application service owners or anything like that. Um, in addition to 
Casper itself, there's also like a, a secondary assessment that Acuity Insights offers called Duet, which is about a value alignment. Um, some professional schools use Duet and Casper, some use only Casper. The goal of Casper is to assess some non-academic skills and qualities, things like communication, empathy, professionalism, judgment, problem solving, et cetera. And the fee for the exam is $85, which includes up to seven schools. You can pay $18 per additional school. Um, and the application is free if you have a fee waiver from AMCAS or ACOMAS. The format of Casper is basically, you are gonna be presented with 14 scenarios. Some of them are gonna be presented in writing and some of them are gonna be presented in video form. And you are gonna to have to respond to each of those scenarios either in writing or by recording a video. So when you're writing a response, you're gonna get five minutes to answer three questions. And for video responses, you're gonna have one minute to record a response to each of two questions. Casper is scored by trained human raters. It's not automatically scored. Grammar is not a factor. Really, the um, completeness of your thoughts and the logic of your thinking, the way that you are describing your responses is much more important than, uh, you know, the completeness of a sentence, for example. Um, the scores are shared with professional programs. Examinees do not get their individual score, but they will um, they will tell you what quartile you're scoring. So you're in the top 25%, you're in the second 25, the third 25, the fourth 25. This is an exam that you'll take at home, so you do not need to go to a testing center, although a webcam is required and there are strict proctoring arrangements. You can only test once in a year with Casper and your scores are only valid for one application cycle. So if you test this year, and don't end up applying or end up reapplying in a future cycle, you would need to, to complete Casper every year that you're planning to apply. Um, if you are uh, applying to a program that requires Casper, I would say some good things for you to do now are to check out the school's requirements, um, whether they require the duet assessment as well, to get familiar with the test format and the system requirements to do some sample questions and most importantly to practice the exam timing. This test is designed to make you feel some time pressure when you're writing or, or um, saying your responses to these questions. So getting familiar with like what it feels like to have five minutes to answer these questions can be really helpful. The second assessment that I want to talk about is the AAMC preview exam. This is required at a small list of schools. So I have them here on the screen. If you are planning to apply to any of these schools, yes, you're going to need to take preview because it is required at these programs. Um, there are a number of schools that require either Casper or preview. I would say if you're only applying to programs otherwise that require Casper and you're applying to one of these that requires either, you can just stick with Casper. You don't need to add on the preview unless you're applying to a school that strictly requires it. Um, this list is subject to change, uh, but this is the most current list as of today. The goal of the preview exam is a little bit different from Casper. It is used to assess your understanding of the pre-professional competencies that the AAMC has created. Um, the fee for this exam is $100 flat fee, no matter how many schools you send it to. And the first registration for this test is free if you have fee assistance through the AAMC. The test is offered through March through September. So you could register at any time uh, over the course of the spring or summer for this. And there's a lot more information at the website. This test works differently. You're given 30 scenarios and a list of, I think, like nine or 10 responses to each scenario that you are going to be asked to rate on a four point effectiveness scale, sort of not not effective at all, somewhat effective, effective, uh, very effective, something like that. Right. So you're going to have to rate each of the responses um, in terms of how effective they are. And the test is scored by comparing your ratings to ratings that have been given by medical educators. So essentially what Preview is doing is saying, hey, we have all these scenarios and we know what professional physicians would say for each of them. The, uh, the closer you get to thinking like a physician, the better you're gonna do on this exam, essentially. You get full credit um, if you get an exact match. So like if the medical educator said something is very effective and you said it's very effective, great, that's full credit. If the medical uh, evaluator said it's uh, very effective and you said effective, then you get partial credit because you're close. 
This test is scored on a scale of one to nine with five as the median, and you will receive your score and the percentile associated with the score. It's also taken at home. Um, there are limits on when you can test. You can test up to two times per year and four times in a lifetime. This is different from last year. So if anyone's a reapplicant or has taken this before, uh, you are able to retest now. And you should check individual school requirements regarding um, kind of expiration dates for the test. You know, how, how recent does the score have to be? Um, you may not have to take the score, th this test again, if say you have a, a score from last year. Um, here again, in terms of preparation, familiarizing yourself with the format and system requirements are uh, really, really important. They have a very robust examinee preparation guide that I think is very important to read carefully. There's a full length practice exam. I feel very confident that I would be able to do this exam after going through the practice exam. And I think that's one of the best ways to, to really get yourself prepared for it. Um, the AAMC also provides some other prep resources. Okay, really quickly, um, just a quick review on creating your school list and thinking about uh, who's gonna see all of this stuff that you're submitting. Uh, in recent years, Barnard students and alums who, who have applied to MD programs have applied to around 22 programs on average, although I do recommend pulling it back a little bit. Most people I think should be in a good spot somewhere between 15 and 20 schools. Our average for applications to DO schools um, and dental schools is usually somewhere between about five and 10. Uh, about 10, 10 schools is the, the national average for dental programs. Um, there aren't as many dental programs as medical programs. So most people have a, a smaller number of schools. When you are researching programs, the resources here, which I also um, shared in my uh, Choosing Schools program, are invaluable. MSAR is a fantastic uh, investment for the application year. If you haven't already, I think it's a really great thing to use. Um, the Choose DO Explorer provides some similar information for DO programs. It's free. You just have to register to use it. And the IDEA Official Guide to Dental Schools and Dental School Explorer are also um, a subscription service, but also super helpful. If you're thinking about applying to other uh, health professions, there are a lot of application guides out there as well. Just a quick uh, reminder of some of the factors that I encourage people to consider, but definitely go back to the Choosing Health Profession Schools presentation if you're still building a list and kind of thinking through what, uh, what your priorities are. Now, as you're creating your school list, it's super important to keep notes on the programs that you plan to apply to um, when you are making your final decisions about schools and prepping for secondary applications. It's great to have notes about why you've chosen a particular program. A fairly common secondary question is you know, something on the, along the lines of like, why are you applying to our school? And if you have good, robust uh, notes on why you've chosen particular programs, it's a lot easier to, uh, to answer that question. I also strongly recommend as a spreadsheet person, an inveterate spreadsheet person, it's a great idea to keep a spreadsheet to just track your application status for every school that you're applying to so that you know where you are with each of the programs. And again, remember numbers, things like um, GPA and MCAT scores or DAT scores, these can be limiting factors, but they're not deterministic. Um, you know, you have to be a good fit for the school and be able to articulate your fit to the school um, regardless of where your numbers are. All right, really quickly, some heads up about interviews, even though it's going to be a couple of months before this is um, a, a real issue, I want to make sure everybody knows a little bit about what to expect. Um, most health professions programs offer interviews on something like a rolling basis. So essentially, once your application is complete, you could start hearing from schools about interview offers. And that means that the earlier your application is complete in the cycle, the earlier you could potentially hear from programs. Now, different schools have different procedures. They have different numbers of application reviewers. All sorts of things will affect the timeline on which you actually hear about things like interviews. But I think that you give yourself the greatest chances overall if you are applying relatively early in the cycle. And for me, that usually means planning to submit an application in the month of June. Um, most interviews are gonna take place between August and March. Um, the largest number I would say are uh, are in the fall with um, some schools doing 
uh, a smaller number of interviews in the spring. But again, individual school timelines can vary massively. Um, historically, I found that most invitations are sent out by January, but since we've been doing virtual interviews, I have noticed that some schools have edged a little bit later in the spring. Um, so it's not unusual to get interview offers in February or even March, and I've heard of interviews being offered even later than that. You can check school websites for their individual timelines, as well as information about their interview days. And this is great to do, um, you know, once you've submitted your secondaries and are kind of thinking about what to expect. Interviews usually happen in a few different types. Um, there's the traditional interview where you're basically, you know, talking to a person or more than one person about your application. Um, they may have access to your application. They may not have access to your application. Many schools also use the MMI, multiple mini interview format. Um, this is an interview format that was created at the same institution that created the CASPER. So it's focused much more on situational judgment, providing you with a scenario and asking you to talk through how you would respond to that scenario. And there are schools that do both, um, <laughs> that maybe have an MMI with a one traditional interview station, or maybe do a couple of MMI stations and, uh, and a traditional interview as well. You will have access to interview preparation resources through Beyond Barnard. I do an interview prep workshop in very early September every year, and we offer mock interviews all year round at Beyond Barnard. Uh, most schools are probably going to still be offering virtual interviews, particularly MD programs seem to be leaning toward um, virtual, although I do know a number of DO schools um, are offering in-person interviews these days. Schools are able to set these policies individually and travel costs can be significant, so it's wise to save for potential interview travel just in case. And then finally, some resources and I'll open it up for questions. Uh, you all know you can find advising support through individual appointments, um, which you can make with me through Handshake. Um, we have writing workshop exercises that you can use. I've um, shared with you all the information about the writing fellows who are generously offering conferences for folks who are working on personal statements. And I'm happy to take a look at advanced drafts of personal statements for comments about like overall content and structure and things like that. The links here I think are all really helpful for folks who are planning to apply this year. Um, these are links to various application um, readiness resources for the three main application services that we've been talking about today. I also want to draw your attention if you're applying to MD programs later this week. Um, on Wednesday, there's going to be a, um, a webinar on navigating the 2025 AMCAS cycle where AMCAS staff are going to dive even deeper into the application from, from their side. So if you are planning to apply to AMCAS, I highly recommend registering for that event. If you register for it and you aren't able to attend, they'll send you the recording later. You can also follow these application services on social media if you so desire. It actually can be helpful because um, some of them do offer updates on processing times and things like that. So handles are here for various, uh, and these are typically similar um, handouts across platforms. Okay, with that, I'm gonna open it up for questions. I'm just gonna stop sharing so that I can see folks and... Let's see. Uh, was there a question? Let's see. When do mock interviews offered by Beyond Barnard usually start? Just to have an idea, we're they're continually offered. There's no there's no start time. We uh, I do interview prep all the time. Um, and if you want to meet with somebody who's not me, uh, you can also schedule with another one of my colleagues. I have shared with my colleagues um like some questions that are sort of typical for uh, health profession schools interviews so um yeah doesn't matter who uh, and we're here year round um let's see uh question about do we do mock mmis so 
individually, you can't really do a full mock MMI. You need a lot of people <laughs> to do an MMI session because normally there's something like seven to eight stations and a bunch of applicants rotating through. So I can't individually do a full MMI session, but I do have many MMI style questions that I have written. So I know you haven't seen them anywhere else. And, um, and my colleagues have access to those as well. So if you want to practice MMI type questions, we can definitely do that. Um, if you schedule an appointment for interview prep, you can just note the kind of interview that you're hoping to prepare for in the appointment description. And I got a question in the chat about study abroad courses. If your courses are listed on your Barnard transcript, you still have to request a transcript from the study abroad institution as well. It really depends on the specifics of the situation, um, and it's too complicated, I think, for me to explain. If you are, um, if you transferred credits back to Barnard, it is quite possible that you can get a transcript exception, but you should double check um, the, uh, there's a there's a whole page on the AMCAS um, application, like on the sort of FAQs about the different kinds of study abroad programs and the requirements for, um, for reporting. If you were, uh, like let's say you did a study abroad program that was based at a US-based institution, and you transferred the credits to Barnard, you would still probably need to request that transcript. So like if you did NYU's program in London, you'd wanna request a transcript from NYU because it's a US institution, they offer a transcript. If you register directly at Oxford, because British transcripts are not accepted by AMCAS, but you got the credits transferred to Barnard, you would request a transcript exception there um, because the courses are on your Barnard transcript and they're not available on another transcript. It is very annoying. Um, and that is why I love uh, the, the manuals um, so much. Okay, um, scrolling down to the next questions. Um, if you've requested an official transcript for other purposes and uh, you know, if you're, if nothing, if, if nothing has changed about your, um, your transcript, since you've requested an official copy, you can use that official copy for your data side, uh, but you will still need to request a transcript to be sent directly to your application services. Um, then there's a question about the AAMC fee assistance. Yes, so if you have um, applied to AAMC fee assistance and been approved, then you get a fee waiver for AMCAS and you get to apply to up to 20 schools with that fee waiver. If you want to apply to more than 20 schools, you have to pay the additional school um, process there. Um, is the committee process part three optional because the committee will get the final version of our application? Um, yes. So committee par process part three is not optional, I would say, but the updates in that section are optional. So you don't have to include any updates as part of that process. You do have to let us know where you're, uh, like what application service you're applying to and when you submitted your primary application, but you don't have to submit updates because we're gonna ask for that copy of your, uh, your primary application. So we'll have all of the data in, in that application. Okay, I don't think we have any other questions in the chat. Any others that are coming up? I would say for now, poke around the manuals, the instruction manuals for your intended application services. Start to get familiar. Once the application service opens, you can start logging in, start plugging in your data, start you know playing around with the different aspects of the systems and getting familiar. And if you have questions, usually some combination of the application service manual, me and the help staff for the application service are going to be able to help you out. So um, there are some things that I'm super familiar with, uh, but there are other things. There's always a new question. Every year somebody has a question that I realize I have never answered before. Um, so, you know, there are lots of resources at your disposal for answering these and uh, and for getting all of this material together as you're creating the application. Um, keep in mind, you know, it's a big process. There are lots of tiny little details. And so just taking it step by step, staying organized and staying calm is 
a big piece of the battle here. So I look forward to working with you all over the course of the application cycle. I'm going to send you the slides and uh, the recording of this probably tomorrow or Wednesday. So um, definitely feel free to refer back and I will see you all as we're uh, as we're getting ready for the summer application cycle. I'll be I'll be emailing lots more information too, so don't worry. I'll be around. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks so much.